Welcome back. In this second part of the first week's lectures for 345, I want to talk a little bit about the history of structural engineering. And in particular, I want to show that this is not only a way that we solve structural problems, obviously it is, uh, but it's also something that gives us as designers, as architects, a kind of grammar and a language that we've used throughout history uh, to give our buildings both kind of a recognizable order, structural order typically, uh, and also uh, to, to use elements in ways that uh, resonate with our intuitive understanding uh, of how structures work. Um, there's an old saying that uh, of all the kind of engineers, a structural engineer is going to be the architect's best friend and worst enemy. We probably spend the most time with them because structure is pervasive throughout the building. It's not something like mechanical systems that we can sort of tuck away in shafts or in ceilings. It's really going to uh, order the entire space or entire set of spaces that we're working with as architects. And so it's important to see not only how structures actually work, which of course we'll spend a lot of time doing, but also how they're integrated with architectural ideas and how, I think anyway, in a lot of cases, they really inspire some of the architectural ideas that, that we work with every day. So this is a, a necessarily brief, abridged uh, history that, that I, I want to look at uh, structural engineering not only as a, a, a discipline that has to do with what we want to accomplish, right, bridging large spans, building tall buildings, but that also looks at taking advantage of what we have to hand. So. Five or 6,000 years ago, uh, if you were uh, a human being in North America, you had access to a kind of wealth of natural materials, wood, stone, uh, dirt, things like this, that you could certainly make good shelter out of, good structural uh, designs out of. Today we have a different palette of materials, and you can easily think of the steel and fiberglass and concrete and aluminum, other things that we work with, as better. There's certainly higher performance, um, but they come at, at costs that that older palette of materials certainly didn't have, right? Environmental costs, uh, human costs, cost of labor, transport, things like that. In all of these cases, I want to make the case that these are designers looking at what they want to accomplish, a space that they want to bridge over, or a number of floors that they want to stack on top of one another, and they're looking very carefully at the, the structural uh, uh, properties of the materials that they have to hand, whether that is uh, timber from a forest that's maybe right next door, uh, or aluminum that may have to travel 15 or 20,000 miles by the time it gets from the bauxite uh, or mine to the actual job site. And the other point I want to make out is that through all of this, the structural principles stay the same. As humans, we've discovered or we've refined our understanding, our mathematical modeling of structures, our theoretical understanding of how structures work. Uh, but we're also lucky that as a species, we're born with structural intuition. And, and this makes perfect sense. If we were to survive on the African savanna or the plains of North America uh, back five or 10,000 years ago, um, we didn't have much to defend ourselves. We could run pretty quickly, uh, but in a hurry, we often needed to climb a tree or jump uh, uh, over a, a, a set of rocks or a stream or something. And so one of the tools in our survival mindset is, well, you know, what kind of branch, tree branch is gonna support us? And I like showing this cartoon and saying, okay, imagine that you are uh, on the savanna 20,000 years ago, you're being chased by uh, some uh, human eating tiger, and you have a choice. You can grab onto the branch on the left, or you can grab onto the branch on the right. Now, 20,000 years ago, you wouldn't have known anything about cantilever theory. Sitting there right now, you probably don't know very much about cantilever theory. Trust me, by the end of SciTech, you absolutely will. But in the sort of back of your mind, your survival mind, uh, you would know that the branch on the left seems to be much, much stronger. Right? There's something about that shape, deeper at the root, tapering toward the end, that we know intuitively uh, is going to be, be better able to hold our weight uh, than the branch on the right. Now, we learn this through kind of interacting with our environment, but we also have this kind of inborn intuition that tells us that a cantilever, a branch on a tree, wants to be shaped like the, the, the branch on the left. And when we go back and look at 
uh, ancient architecture, no matter where it is in the world, we find that these kind of elementary structural principles uh, are at work. If you are an Egyptian builder in 3500 BC and you want to build the tallest tombs for your uh, leaders that you can, uh, you know intuitively that a big pile of rocks is going to be sturdier, stabler, if it has a wider base and a narrow top, right, if it's in a, the shape of a pyramid. Triangle is a shape that we're going to see over and over and over again. It's a signature of one of those five S's, stability. Wider at the base, narrower at the top. There are other things going on structurally in these pyramids, but there's not very much. These are what we call pure compressive structures. There's no span involved. These are just really clever piles of rocks. There are interesting stories about how we think the Egyptians may have built them. But from a structural point of view, uh, a, a pyramid is really just the, the most effective column shape you can possibly build. And all it's doing is holding up what we call the dead weight of the structure. In other words, its own weight, the weight that's not doing uh, anything. It's not an air conditioner. It's not a pile of books. It's literally just the structure's own weight. And for that own weight, a pyramid is exactly the right shape. It is not going anywhere. These things have stood there for 3,500 years without tipping over or flying away. So there's certainly some intuition at work there. It's not much after the pyramids, though, that we start to see structures that show what today we think of as proper shapes for relatively specialized situations. Uh, here is a, a stone gate at uh, the, the uh, Cretan colony of Mycenae. And you can see that there's some things going on that are uh, a little bit more complex than we might expect. They're bridging over uh, about a 10-foot uh, gap, a 10-foot doorway or gateway. And you can see that the stone that they've put over that doorway is deeper in the middle than it is on the ends. Just like that cantilevered beam, the, the, the branch that, that we would have to grab onto as we're being chased by a tiger, a beam's shape is responsive to the distribution of bending forces throughout it. And as we'll find out in 347, the greatest bending force in a beam, uh, what we call a simply supported beam, is at its midspan. And the Mycenaean builders didn't have what today we think of as beam theory, but they had the intuition to know that a beam that's deeper in the middle certainly looks stronger and actually is stronger uh, than a beam that was just flat all the way across. There are other things going on here that are fascinating too. This triangular stone above the beam is actually a really good reflection of how loads flow through a wall or a planar structural element. And the beam down here is literally picking up only the weight of that triangular stone, even when the wall was complete, right? The wall is obviously uh, not survived uh, in its entirety. But the Mycenaeans knew intuitively that this beam was not going to be picking up the weight of the stones to either side of that. And today, we know that that is exactly how loads flow through a planar structural element, a, a, a wall. So here we are about 2,500 years ago, and we see that uh, there are what we think of as ancient building cultures who have a very sophisticated, intuitive understanding uh, of structural form, right? What forms or what shapes are most appropriate to what structural situations? Now, that can get refined in all kinds of ways. Uh, the Greeks wanted nothing to do with curved beams. They had architectural aspirations that demanded that their buildings be built of more or less straight lines. And they developed a system of visual refinements that took principles like column shapes. Uh, these are Doric columns here. You've probably heard about Doric columns in architectural history class. But if you look, they're based on some structural principles. They're a little bit wider at the base than at the top, so they understand the principle of stability that kind of spreads your feet out uh, at the base, narrows toward the top. Uh, it's not quite a triangular form, but it's you know starting to approximate one, right? A, a, a wide base and a skinny top. Up here, you can see these are beams uh, that run from column to column, and you see that they are stones that are cut so that the joint lines fall directly over the center lines of the columns. And even though these beams aren't the quote-unquote proper shape, they're not deeper in the middle than, than at the ends, 
The Greeks understood that there was something about putting the joints of the beams over the center lines of the columns that made the whole structure a little bit more stable. Uh, this is the principle be behind what we call a simply supported beam, that it's allowed to span from column center line to column center line, and there's nothing restraining the beam or keeping it from uh, rotating at, at, at either end. It's literally just kind of plunked uh, on top of the column. The real point I want to make about Greek building, though, is that here we have kind of architecture and engineering feeding off one another. Now, we can't really call what the Greeks did engineering. There is no mathematics behind it uh, in the sense that we use it today. But there's a lot of intuition and there's a lot of kind of embodied knowledge from having built, by this point, hundreds and hundreds of temples throughout the, the, the Greek world to know what works and what doesn't, to understand the kind of rough proportions about how deep a beam needs to be to span a certain distance, about how wide a column needs to be at the base uh, to prevent it from tipping over, to prevent the whole building from falling over uh, in a windstorm. And then there is this kind of ornamentation, right, or this aestheticization, this taking structural principles like that uh, and turning it into art. Those Doric columns are not just columns that are wider at the base than they are at the top. They have flutes on them, they have capitals on them, the proportions of them are very, very finely tuned, well beyond what we would need to just put a column in there that stood up. They're there to also please the eye, to make the building seem harmonious. And one of the things that they play on is our internal idea of what makes a good structure, what a good sturdy column looks like, what a sufficiently sized beam looks like, what a regular structural order composed of bays that have kind of reasonable spans, in this case maybe 10 or 12 feet uh, in stone, uh, looks like. So using structural principles, kind of decorating or ornamenting those structural principles, but also using them as the basis uh, for a kind of architectural grammar. Now, when we get new materials, we get new forms. This is one of the real lessons about structural engineering is that it's not just form follows function, it's also form follows the qualities of the materials that we use. So when Roman builders come along and want to build similarly large basilicas or large temples, uh, they look to the Greeks for aesthetic inspiration, but they have a material that the Greeks didn't have, which is concrete. They had access to volcanic soil uh, that when it's hydrated or uh, put into water, uh, turns into basically a calcified limestone, right? It's, it's, it's sort of man-made stone. And they use this to create monolithic structures, not structures that are composed of little stone pieces, but structures that really, no matter how large they are, work as one giant piece. Today we call that hyperstatic. What that means is that when we put a, a load onto a concrete structure, um, it has a million possible different ways that it can uh, track down to the ground. We can't even calculate all of them. We just know that uh, there are multiple redundancies, right, or multiple ways that that load can be, can be handled. This makes these structures extremely efficient uh, and also extremely safe. If the structure gets damaged, as you see here, this is only half of the Basilica of Maxentius in Rome. The other half uh, had been destroyed and eroded in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, but what's left of it is still standing. And this is because the, the remainder of it is still monolithic, still hyperstatic, still has millions of ways that its own dead load or wind loads uh, can track down uh, to the ground. The Romans were able to build larger buildings, larger spans with concrete, uh, and they were also able to build different shapes. Very hard to build a semicircle out of stone. You have to carve it very, very accurately with giant uh, templates or giant uh, in-place compasses. Uh, in concrete, all you have to do is form a timber structure where you can go back and you can refine the shape again and again until you get it right, pour the concrete on top of that, and hey presto, you've got a semicircular arch. Uh, not the perfect shape for an arch, but one that for the Romans was good enough, right? one that they could build uh, and that was strong enough to structure uh, these large buildings of theirs.
And really we see that tradition uh, continuing throughout the, the Middle Ages, especially in Byzantine architecture, where builders took these ideas of semicircular arches, semicircular domes, and pushed them really to fantastic limits. Uh, here are the Hagia Sophia in what was then Constantinople, now Istanbul, uh, probably about as large spanning a dome and certainly as tall a building uh, as you could get given the technology that those builders had. Um, this is a stone building. Concrete had already disappeared uh, as a technology by the time the Hagia Sophia was built. Um, but you can see that they're borrowing on some of the principles that they learned from Roman architecture. And they're using things like brick uh, and small stones. They're using uh, mortar instead of concrete to kind of glue all of these pieces together. Uh, and they understand a little bit about how these domes work not as modern domes, right? Today we would use reinforced concrete. We would rely on steel uh, to help us with uh, the, the way domes work. Here they're basically taking Roman principles and pushing them to their absolute limits. And when I say absolute limits, the Hagia Sophia actually collapsed twice uh, and was rebuilt to more or less the same proportions both times. Um, that tells you that they are really pushing the materials that they had uh, to their limits. Again, though, there is an architectural impact. And this kind of golden dome, right, in a religious building has very, very clear emotional uh, aspirations, right? This is the kind of dome of the heavens brought down to earth, right? There in a building form to inspire the, the people coming to, to services below. The structure here is fairly sophisticated for its time, but it's really put to architectural ends, right? The dome is really a, a metaphor uh, and a way to get people to uh, connect themselves with the higher up, right? With, with the heavens. Structure in the service of uh, architecture and this relationship between religious architecture, especially, uh, and structural engineering is one that we'll see over and over again. A little bit later, uh, in the late Middle Ages, 13th and 14th century, we see structure again in the service of an architectural principle, Gothic cathedrals uh, in northern France and southern England, which rely on limestone, very, very strong material, very, very easy to carve. Uh, limestone in these more and more efficient structural vaults, taller and taller. The Gothic builders uh, began with relatively small churches where they used these groin vaults, they're called. You can see the X's in the ceiling. Um, we understand a little bit better today how those work. We're able to model them mathematically uh, and sort of do forensic engineering to understand how they work. The Gothic architects really proceeded almost kind of on a hunch at first. Uh, there are things about those cross vaults that make them inherently stable and inherently stiff and sturdy. And you can see on the right that as Gothic builders built taller and taller, every town wanted their cathedral to be taller than the next. And so there is this kind of evolutionary pressure, right? The drive to build taller makes uh, Gothic builders look around, see what was successful uh, in the town next door and see if they can go maybe five feet higher or 10 feet higher or 20 feet higher until you get to this one. This is Beauvais Cathedral uh, in Northern France. This one collapsed twice. And this was the tallest Gothic building uh, that the, the, uh, the builders of the time ever attempted. You can see that later Gothic cathedrals here uh, actually took that down a notch, right? If Beauvais is going to collapse, then maybe we need to come down five or 10 feet. Uh, and maybe we need to build uh, these buttresses, what are called flying buttresses, a kind of staple of Gothic architecture, maybe those need to be a little bit uh, thicker, right, or a little bit more robust. There's a great kind of lesson here, right, that when we proceed intuitively, uh, when we proceed based on kind of uh, iterations, right, uh, building something over and over, testing the limits just a little bit each time, uh, we will make progress, um, but we always have the situation where if we test a failure, things will fail. And today we don't really accept the idea that buildings can collapse. We get our knowledge more theoretically. We are able to model these things much more carefully, understand the mechanisms that make them stand up, understand what might make them fall down. Uh, and we have a, a great track record of designing, using structural theory, doing all of the modeling first, and then going out and building it fairly confident that we understand how the structure is going to work. Gothic builders had none of this. All they had was the experience of, we're able to build it this tall with buttresses that are this big uh, until 
it doesn't work. And once it doesn't work, that establishes the kind of limits of, of structural knowledge. A way forward, if you don't have the detailed math and simulation and calculus and things that we do today, but one that risks these big structural failures. And structural engineering is one of the subdisciplines where health, safety, and welfare really comes into play. If we get it wrong, our buildings come down and they can not only hurt people, but, but even kill them. It's not until the Renaissance that we start to see this, the beginning of what I would call structural theory of architects or builders, engineers, not quite sure what to call them at this point, who start to throw some mathematical ideas at their structures. And some of the first evidence we have for this is in the dome of Florence Cathedral. Uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, who had been a goldsmith and a jeweler, was very adept at designing uh, watch mechanisms and things like this, gets the commission to put uh, a dome over the old uh, church. Uh, and what he builds is often thought of as the first Renaissance building in Florence, or one of the early ones, but it's actually really a, one of those Gothic groin vaults just on a dome instead of on a rectangular bay. And Brunelleschi was very clever about building cranes and building kind of primitive elevators and things like that that allowed workers to uh, do all the work so far up uh, in, the, in, the, in the building. Um, but the structure of the dome itself is also really, really clever. It's what we call a double shell. It has two skins of masonry, an inside skin and an outside skin. And those two work in harmony. They work like what today we think of as a giant I-beam. I-beam has a, a web in the middle and two flanges, one on either side. And it's those flanges and the distance between them that give an I-beam its strength. Again, we will talk a lot about this uh, in 347. But the uh, Brunelleschi's dome does some of the same things. These two skins connected together uh, work in harmony to span over the, the very, very large oculus of the dome. And you can see, too, that he adopted the Gothic pointed arch, which was one of the big kind of structural innovations uh, of the 14th century. Uh, here you see it in the early 15th century forming, again, not a groin vault, but instead a dome. Well, there is a young kid in Florence who watches the, the cathedral dome go up and is fascinated by it, comes by and sketches it uh, every day when he's about 15 or 16. Uh, and that kid grows up to be one of Florence's greatest scientists, Renaissance uh, figures, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci has a lifelong fascination with structures. And he does some of the first experiments trying to understand, uh, in the case on the left, how a beam works mechanically. What's going on inside the beam when you put a load on it, right? That's the little sandbag hanging from it. He doesn't quite get it right, but he inspires others to continue his thought experiments. Uh, on the right is the astronomer and scientist Galileo, thinking about a cantilever beam, uh, thinking about how the, the mechanics of, a, of those branches on the savanna or the, the, the North American grassland might work. And you can see that he's labeled the beam in such a way that he's trying to understand how a weight here translates into a set of forces here at A and B. And that is fundamental to understanding uh, beam mechanics thinking about how forces get transmitted through a solid object. Um, Galileo didn't get it quite right either, but in another hundred years, uh, more scientists start to work on some of the same problems. Uh, Christopher Wren, who was an astronomer and architect back in the day when you could be seven or eight different things all at once, uh, teams up with uh, a college classmate of his named Robert Hooke. They work together on the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. They do something very, very different from what's done at Florence. This is actually a single structure, a conical brick uh, piece in the middle that has two architectural skins that do nothing structurally. Uh, one on the inside that relates to the scale of the, the, the church space below, and one on the outside that gives the, the church its presence on the skyline. It's the brick piece in the middle that is Robert Hooke's contribution. And, and we think of him really as maybe the first consulting structural engineer. Wren can't solve the problem of the dome. He calls Hook in, and Hook knows something about structural form that makes that cone, triangular section, uh, seem like it's going to do the, do the job, and in fact it does. Now, Hook and Wren also uh, carry on these thought experiments about how beams work, and they add to 
the renaissance and enlightenment science that goes into structural engineering. And we start to see formulas develop that get closer and closer to how we understand beams work today. Um, this will not be on the test, uh, but this is the deflection formula for a cantilevered beam. Uh, it tells you how far a beam will deflect with a given length and a given load. Uh, e is the stiffness of the material you're using, and I is a measure of the cross-sectional shape, basically whether it's an I-beam or uh, whether it's a rectangle, something like that. It's a slightly frightening looking equation, um, but what I want to do is dissect it for just a second, kind of historically. Leonardo uh, basically picked up on ancient Greek thought that looked at what Aristotle had called the principle of levers, right? Understanding that a beam is basically just a, a very, very strange lever. We'll talk about this uh, in, the, in next week's uh, lecture when we talk about uh, equilibrium, right? The same principles that make uh, a lever balance out or allow you to lift a load with a lever uh, are at work kind of in reverse in a beam. Aristotle figured this out. Leonardo threw some math to it. Galileo understood that the length of the beam was also important, that the deflection was in some ways proportional to, he thought, the square of the length. He didn't actually carry out the experiments to see whether he was right. And in fact, uh, he'd get corrected in another couple hundred years. He knew also that the deeper the beam, the less the deflection. This makes sense. If you have a really, really deep beam, you push on it on the end, it's going to deflect a little bit less. He understood that it was proportional to the cube of the depth, and that shows up in this mysterious figure, uh, I, moment of inertia. Uh, later on, two British scientists uh, figured out what moment of inertia actually was, what the geometrical property actually was, and what the formula was. Today we can look it up for any uh, steel or concrete shape we want. And that it added an additional factor uh, of length to the, to the deflection. So instead of the cube of the depth, it's actually proportional to the, the, the fourth power uh, of the depth. Robert Hooke, who uh, was uh, Wren's collaborating engineer, had this phrase, uctensio sigvis, which means that uh, the, the more you load uh, a beam, the more it's going to deflect. That seems very intuitive, uh, but Hooke understood that it was proportional, that it was uh, absolutely, the, if you add twice as much load, the beam will deflect twice as much. Seems intuitive now, it's not always necessarily uh, the case. And finally, this Swiss uh, engineer, uh, Leonard Euler, realized that there's this figure E, a measurement of a material stiffness. It's called the modulus of elasticity, a real kind of nerd phrase. But Euler realized that materials have different capacity for resisting deflection. And so a material that's very stiff, like say steel, is going to deflect less than a material like timber that's of the same shape. Now all of that is to show that our understanding of uh, structural theory has built up over time. That we go from the Renaissance where people see phenomenon and they try to throw thought experiments at it, to the Enlightenment and the kind of industrial era where we finally have the mathematical tools to understand some of the, the principles behind how structures actually work. And we rely on those tools today, albeit with a lot more computing power than they had in the 18th century. But you can see this uh, affecting uh, architects and builders almost right away. Uh, here in the late 17th century, this is Claude Perrault's uh, facade for the Louvre Palace in Paris. And to us, from the outside, it looks like a very, very simple classical building. But if you look at those columns, you can see that instead of being like a Greek temple, where they have a single bay uh, or single bay dimension all the way across the front, he's paired the columns up. And this gives you uh, a stone beam here that's much, much too long to span by itself. Perot was one of the first to understand that he could use the theories that were coming out of Enlightenment scientists and apply those to structural situations. He used iron in the facade of the Louvre and calculated, not totally accurately, but accurately enough, the facade is still there, he calculated how much iron he would need to help the stone carry its own load over those much, much bigger spans. And the east facade of the Louvre is one of the first iron structures uh, that, that we know of where the builder actually did some math and tried to figure out how iron could best help him 
span, these bigger and bigger uh, spans that were part of the architectural style of the day. This is an architectural desire for bigger spans driving the engineering. A scientific understanding of what iron could do comes about in the early 19th century in English mill construction when building with cast iron uh, then, not, not yet steel, uh, builders start to realize that there's something about the shape that they're using. They start using these iron beams with these little tabs on the bottom, uh, mostly at first to, uh, to hold up brick arches that support the floor. But they realize that those tabs weirdly make the beams much, much stronger, uh, much more so than just adding uh, a cross-sectional area to the beam anywhere. And we start to get these uh, scientists, Navier and Fairbairn, who begin to understand that the shape of those iron beams is critical to how they perform, how they're able to span distances, how they're able to carry loads. This is the genesis of the modern uh, I-beam. Unlike Galileo, unlike Leonardo, they actually do empirical testing. They have a theory, they figure out an experiment that will let them test their theory, they go get a whole bunch of cannonballs and they load up a beam and they measure its deflection at the midpoint and they see whether the real world matches their theoretical understanding or not. This to us sounds like really obvious, right? It's the way you do science. But it's critical in the 19th century that it develops as a way of testing those theories and refining those theories. And gradually we get formulas, especially for iron construction, that allow us to reliably design structures that we know won't fall down. It doesn't always work at first. Theories are always subject to revision and refinement. But for the first time, we get what, we, what I would call a theoretical understanding of structures. We can think it through in our heads. We can throw some math at it, use some formulas, use some basic principles, and confidently go out and design a structure that we know is going to stand up. There are great tests of this. The Britannia Tubular Bridge uh, by Robert Stevenson is this fantastic story of an engineer who has a hunch, uh, does the math to prove to uh, himself that it, it's gonna work at his own risk, goes out and builds this bridge for his family railway company. Uh, the bridge works, uh, it carries locomotives over this previously unbridgeable strait, and suddenly we have not only a structural principle that's proven, but we also have this sudden enthusiasm, right? What else could we bridge? Could we build a bridge that was longer? Could we take the, the tubular shape that seems to have some magic spanning properties and find more efficient ways to, to use it? And by the end of the 19th century, we not only have better structural principles, but we have better structural materials. Instead of cast iron, which is kind of a crude, uh, fragile material, we have steel, which is uh, incredibly reliable, uh, incredibly precise, uh, and a material that we can cut and shape in ways uh, that we couldn't with cast iron. So we get much more sophisticated structures like the Firth of Forth Bridge uh, here in the early 1890s, the first uh, all steel bridge uh, in, in the world and one that utilizes what we call a cantilever principle uh, where they're building these three towers outward from these little rock outcrops and those will eventually meet. But the engineers have thought through how to keep the bridge stable before the bridge is actually put together. Right? And balancing each side of these cantilevers, uh, watching them grow outward uh, toward each other from these little rocky outcrops. At the same time, steel has other uh, possibilities. Uh, it allows us not only to span long distances, but also to rise to great heights. And so architects, builders, engineers in New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, find ways to exploit steel to go not only to not only span farther, but also to build taller, to stack more and more rent paying floors on top of one another uh, in, in big cities. Um, there is also this idea that develops about structural art that uh, really, really efficient structures can not only be economical, but they can be beautiful. Uh, here, an engineer uh, in France designing uh, a bridge over a, a river gorge for the French railways uh, comes up with this parabolic shape that is not only the right shape for its load path, right? Not a semicircle, but actually something more like a parabola. Uh, he comes up with connections that uh, allow the arch to bend and flex a little bit without damaging the foundations, but that also give the bridge this real sense of grace, right? This, this really sort of elegant, uh, pristine, very precise uh, appearance. Uh, 
Um, that engineer, Gustave Eiffel, goes on to build some other things in Paris, uh, especially uh, that rely on some of those principles. New materials, new forms, early 20th century, concrete becomes a proven technology, and we see engineers in Italy using it to build not only factories for automotive companies, but also test tracks on the roof of those factories to test the automobiles. You can't do this in timber, you certainly can't do it in stone. Uh, uh, steel, it would be difficult to get such a continuous curved surface. Concrete is perfect uh, for, for this kind of, uh, of form. Curvature also allows us to make more efficient bridges. Uh, here's a Swiss engineer named Robert Maillard. Uh, who designs these bridges in the Swiss mountainside that take structural principles and again kind of elevate them to an art form. Uh, and here they are doing a, a shell structure, an exhibition structure uh, for the very young Swiss concrete industry in 1930, showing that this new wonder material allows you to uh, span very large spaces with very, very thin edges. We will talk about this structure in uh, ARC 445, and we'll talk about why it is not quite as simple, maybe not quite as pristine and elegant uh, as it actually looks. And the uh, concrete continues to inspire sort of structural poets throughout the 20th century. Uh, here, a Mexican builder named Felix Candela, uh, maybe one of the most uh, poetic, most evocative concrete uh, forms on, on the planet. This is a small restaurant on a lakefront uh, in Mexico City, and he is not only using the, the plasticity of concrete, the, uh, its ability to cake on uh, any form, he's using some very, very clever geometry called uh, ruled surface principles to find ways to build the formwork for this very, very complex curve, and he's relying on some detailed decisions to get this very, very thin pie crust edge around the outside. Um, that is not the thickness of the shell uh, all the way through, and this is another building that we'll look at. We'll try to uh, explode some of the tricks that Candela used to take these structural principles and to elevate them to, to art. Contemporary uh, engineering relies on, again, a whole host of new materials and techniques. In the 60s, we begin to get structural fabrics that allow us to do uh, very large-scale tents, like you see on the left. We get new structural principles and ways of constructing, like uh, geodesics, uh, Buckminster Fuller's invention that you see here on the right that relies on uh, hundreds or thousands of tiny parts uh, and these principles of networking to build uh, hyperstatic structures, monolithic structures uh, that take advantage of the redundancy, the millions and millions of possible solutions uh, to loading, uh, but they do it no longer in concrete, but actually in networks of steel or aluminum. We also get uh, calculation techniques that enable engineers to more confidently and reliably build taller and taller. So we go from buildings that are four or 500 feet tall at the turn of the 20th century to buildings that are 1,000 feet tall or 2,000 feet tall uh, at the turn of the, of the 20th. Sears Tower in Chicago is an example of a, a structural technique called a moment frame that's blown up to 1,400 feet tall and that relies on literally hundreds and hundreds uh, of these prefabricated steel elements to build it not only uh, efficiently, but to also build it uh, quickly. And today, of course, uh, we are reaching for uh, a kilometer tall. Uh, the the uh, Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia, scheduled for completion in the next few years, is uh, supposedly going to be 3,000 feet tall. At the moment, the tallest uh, occupied structure on the planet is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, uh, which is roughly 2,000 feet tall. This kind of flips the, the, the narrative, uh, takes advantage of uh, a lot of new concrete technology uh, to build to those levels. At the moment, building this in steel uh, wouldn't quite be possible. Concrete is taken over from steel as the kind of material of choice for skyscrapers. We'll talk a lot about uh, why that is uh, as well. On the horizon, what you will deal with uh, when you sit down with structural engineers in your career, um, it's very likely that you will have new materials, uh, something like carbon fiber or composites or smart materials uh, that right now are mostly used in uh, industries like uh, the automotive industry or the aeronautical industry, but we think will gradually trickle down and allow us to build much uh, tighter, much more refined, uh, much more efficient structures in skyscrapers and long span uh, programs as well.
throughout all of this, though, there is this kind of dialogue. And you can look at modern uh, architecture. This is a museum in the south of France by Norman Foster, uh, in the background, obviously, um, basically having a dialogue with a high-tech structure from the 4th or 5th century, uh, a Roman temple constructed uh, in Nîmes. This is a set of builders uh, with a very, very advanced set of uh, knowledge and understanding about the materials they had to hand, uh, mostly, again, uh, limestone, marble, uh, locally available uh, quarried stone. Here is a, a group of architects and engineers uh, who take advantage of the materials that they have to hand, steel, concrete, and glass. And yet, um, this is a recognizable colonnade, right? Similar architectural element is the colonnade at Nîmes. The same column theory that allows these skinny steel uh, columns to stand up, that is exactly the same column theory that allows these slightly thicker, uh, more ornamental columns uh, in, the, in the temple to stand up as well. Different set of theories, different level of confidence in the ability of the material to carry the load, and much more effective materials mean that the proportions are all different, but the program kind of remains the same, right? Uh, having a roof to keep the rain out and having a structure to, to hold the roof up. In the last introductory uh, lecture for 345, we'll look at two case studies, uh, a long span and a high rise, and we'll use those to tease out some of the issues that we uh, deal with when we sit down with a structural engineer, not just in terms of how we design the structure, but uh, how we build it, how we bring small things to the site to end up making big things, and also how we integrate these with architectural principles uh, and the, the aesthetics that we typically, uh, as designers, uh, have as our desires.